So, the floor is yours, Tim. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Um, uh, life is a bit of a marathon, and people who run the marathon say that at a at a point around about three quarters of the way through the course, you are inclined to hit a wall. They call it the wall of the marathoner. So you're, 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 starting, you're starting here at a, at a, at a um, point of where you've set off, and you're aiming for a finishing line here. And around about here, you encounter this, encounter this wall. And unless uh, you do something about it, you're going to suffer physical collapse and never reach the finishing line. And what they say is in order to deal with the wall of the marathoner, you have to stop, completely stop thinking about the finishing line. Stop thinking that you're going from here to there. Stop thinking of all the people who were there waiting to clap when you arrive. And simply say, for me, running is life and life carries on, and I'll simply keep on running and running and running. And well, maybe I'll cross the finishing line, but never mind about that, because then I'll keep on running anyway, because I like running. <laughs> and for me, running is life, uh, running is existence. So in effect, what happens is the marathon at this point inhabits the wall. It says, I'm not going to try and cross it. I'll simply become part of the wall. And run with it and simply keep on running. And when you think about it, that perhaps is the curriculum vitae in the strict sense. The curriculum is, from the Latin, a running course, and vitae is a life. So a curriculum vitae is to run a life, basically, to live, to reorient your whole perspective from the question of going from one, from a start to finish, to thinking about... Oh, oh, oh. You, uh, you should have this one. So. Oh, sorry. Uh, think, think yeah, thinking yeah, about so. thinking so. about um, okay. about carrying on. So uh, life itself, after all, does not go from start to finish. We never knew exactly how we came into the world. We just found ourselves here, and we'll carry on. And we won't actually know when we've gone. Other people <laughs> will. And 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 life itself uh, carries on. Now, I, I learned all this about. Mar I'm, I'm not a marathon runner, but I learned all about marathon running from a a former student, now friend and colleague, uh, Paolo Macagno, I want to acknowledge here. Uh, and Paolo has done some wonderful work uh, in Italy uh, in prisons, actually with, with prisons with, with you know, really pretty hardcore criminals in, murderers and things like that. And, uh, and he proposed that he would get the prisoners to run the marathon around the walls of the prison. So he trained them in, in running the marathon and held some marathon running events, and they were very successful, and families all came, and, and, and the prisoners felt very proud of, of what they were, they were doing. But the key point about it was that this was directly challenging the orthodox notion amongst prison staff that the job they have to do is one of rehabilitation. According to the prison regime, we have some do you, uh, some, some, some characters in, inside who, for whom life has gone wrong, they've, they've gone onto the wrong path, they're in the wrong place, outside in society is the right place with the right rules, and somehow we have to manage for them the transition from where they are now to where they ought to be. Uh, and this does not often meet with very much success. If they manage to reach the point where the prisoner actually gets out of prison, very often they land up in prison again very soon afterwards because somehow their lives are not sorted out. Because what that rehabilitation regime says is that your current life is crap. Your current life is wrong. You've gone on the wrong path. You need to get on the right path. So it's like saying, first of all, in order to go right, you have to realize that you are no good, that your, your life up to now has been worthless and we have to give it some worth and we'll tell you what that worth is. The beauty about the, the running the marathon was that it completely challenged that. It said that actually you are worth something, you can run, and the whole point of running is not to get you out of prison, 
is to get you to realize that there is actually possibility in your present existence. And never mind what the eventual outcome will be, whether you get out of prison or you don't get out of prison, but that you'll be able to carry on with your life and find value in the living of it wherever it happens to be. Uh, so it's a movement from exactly from going from one state to another to going, it's a movement going across from in prison to out of prison to simply carrying on your life. Uh, maybe somehow in the borderlands between, uh, between in and out of prison. I, I find an analogy that is very helpful is simply that of a, of a river. The river is running between its banks. Do we want to cross from one bank to the other? Okay, we'll build a bridge and get people across from one. Or perhaps do we just join with the waters? And the waters are simply running along very happily. And why don't we join with the waters rather than always trying to get from one bank to, to the other? Um, now, we often talk about how nowadays people face an uncertain future and that we are troubled by... Um, by uncertainty, although perhaps you think, well, well, maybe, you know, the one thing that's certain in life is we're all going to die, and perhaps when you, you wish for more certainty, you should be perhaps careful what you wish for. But, but, but anyway, we have this idea that, that, we, that, that uncertainty is somehow a, a regrettable situation and, and that we should try to replace that with certainty. But the, the logic of, of certainty, uncertainty and certainty is still on this horizontal dimension in the, in the terms of this diagram. It's as though you know your, your destination in life has already been set. You need to get out of jail. You need to rejoin mainstream society. What you're not certain about is whether you'll be able to reach it or not. And this is the problem with the, the marathoner who wants to get from the start to the finish, but he's not quite, she's not sure, or she's not sure whether she'll make it through the wall, so that, so that as long as you take this perspective, there's this um, opposition between certainty and uncertainty. A certainty about where the finish line is, an uncertainty about whether you'll actually make it. But the thing about life, I think, is that it's almost defined by excess. As long as life goes on, it overtakes wherever you are. So, so, so life is lived in pure excess. It is continually overtaking itself. It is continually moving on. It's a process of Whitehead called it concrescence, of always uh, uh, undergoing creation together. And, and in that sense, um, the, the, the trouble with the concept of uncertainty is that it presents this excess as a deficit. It makes it look as though the excess of life, the, the capacity of life always to go beyond itself, is actually a lack because it doesn't know exactly where it's, where it's heading. So the shift from this dimension to that dimension is also a shift from the logic of uncertainty to the logic of possibility. So if we move from here to there, we move from uncertainty to possibility. And possibility means not leading towards some predefined point or state, but reaching out from where you are at the moment towards destinations that are completely unknown. But, or, or, or maybe not, not really unknown in the sense, again, of the river, it's going towards, we know it's heading towards the sea, but it hasn't got a definite point at which it's going to come to an end. It's simply, it's simply carrying on. So possibility is, means the, 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 that there is, there is always uh, the, 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 the uh, openness for life to carry on. You could almost call it sustainability too, in, in the sense that we, we should be using the term. The... Pintupi, who are an Ara Abor Aboriginal people of the Western Desert of Australia, explained to their ethnographer, Fred Myers, they said, life, you know, life is a one possibility thing. 
And, and, and what they meant was precisely this sense of, of uh, possibility, a possibility that for them uh, exists in the contours of their landscape that was set down for them by the ancestors in the era of the dreaming. And what they meant by that is that life is not given as a menu of options from which to choose. It's not, there are not multiple possibilities, so you can say, oh, I, I think I'll do this one or that one or the other one, but rather that it is going uh, one way. It, it cannot ever be anything other than singular. You can't, you can't pluralize possibility because it is simply the movement of becoming of life um, itself. So that means, again, using this diagram, that possibility is not lateral, going across from start to finish, but longitudinal, running along. Again, like, like the waters of the river uh, running between its banks. And, of course, in life, uh, uh, we have uh, so many uh, different living beings, some of them human, some of them not, and these lives are all carrying on together. So instead of just one line, we've got, we got lots, of, lots of lines all carrying along together and answering to one another as they go. And I've been using the term correspondence to refer to that. By correspondence, I don't mean in the mathematical or logical sense of matching one set of differences up to another set of differences. I mean it in the, in the strict sense of, of answering to one another, co-responding, um, as when we would traditionally write letters to one another or engage with one another in a conversation, alternately taking turns to, 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 to ask and respond. So uh, already this morning, this idea came up about what does the world ask of us? It's not just what we ask of the world, and that's precisely the sense in which I'm meaning correspondence, that the, it's mutual and, and works both ways. Of course, the world is not, it's not the world, it's all sorts of beings in a world that we're, we're answering to, and the world is simply an umbrella term to cover um, all of those. Um, so there's a key difference here that I, I, I wanted to, to insist on, but between correspondence, all these beings going along together and answering to one another as they go, and interaction which is a back and forth movement, face to face between people occupying two already established positions. So interaction is like a ping pong game, the ball is going backwards and forwards, this conversation is sometimes diagrammed. Um, uh, correspondence is a movement along together. You could imagine, for example, people, uh, friends, companions, walking down the street together and they're walking side by side, they're not looking directly at one another, though maybe their heads just tilt a little way towards the other. They nevertheless, through peripheral vision, keep an eye on the way they're moving, and so they, they coordinate their movements, yes, uh, but they share the same view ahead, uh, and uh, uh, rather than if you're face-to-face, -face, you share different views, and they can carry on uh, walking as they converse with one another and, and many people in research we did on walking said this they felt was the most sociable kind of way we can be with others whereas face-to-face uh, -face interaction is much more tricky uh, partly because each can see what's behind the other's back as a, as a, a, a subterfuge and 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 sh and simply staring at the other person in the face is a very rather aggressive and, and, and difficult, as you know, in any interview situation. And there's a wonderful quote that came up earlier from Lingus saying how, how really in such a situation uh, we think we're in command of it and we're going to face the other person, but then we, we sort of dissemble <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and feel very awkward and wish rather that we were going along together. So we lower our eyes and, 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 and the rest of it. So that's the difference between... Um, correspondence and interaction. And, and there's another dis, uh, distinction I'd like to make here. Well, it's, it's, between, it's between differing and othering, uh, dif difference and otherness. I mean, these, these terms are often used more or less uh, synonymously, but I think there is an important difference to be made. I mean, anthropologists, and I'm an anthropologist, often talk about um, you know, the other, what do, you, what, 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 what do you do when you, you confront, as an anthropologist, radical otherness? 
And actually, there's a lot of a lot of hypocrisy in some of all this because they quote Levinas, which is where it all comes from, and 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 Levinas means meant, said precisely that that this means you you come into the presence of the other person and allow that other person to be the person they are and start a conversation with them. You don't start by putting that person within a categorical framework, working out what kind of person they are and, and uh, <coughs> organizing your, 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 your discourse accordingly. Because when anthropologists talk about cultural otherness, they're always immediately putting the other into a frame of our culture and other cultures. Uh, so there is a, there is a great deal of, of sort of oxymoronic uh, talk about about radical cultural otherness but the problem I have with it is that it is starting from the presumption of me and you as though we are from the start completely other to one another and from there we begin to to integrate um, I think the other way around, rather following Deleuze, that there is a continual process of differentiation. That whatever otherness is, is something that is generated in the process of life. So that difference or other differentiation comes before otherness or diversity. And differentiation and diversity are not the same thing. That differentiation is becoming different and we become different from one another in the very process of going along together. In any conversation, we're joined with other people in conversation, and through that conversation, each of us develops their own singular voice. So that differentiation is that something that is carrying on all the time in social life, and it is carrying on through the process of, of coming together. Uh, whereas the opposite of differentiation, which is of putting people into into completely opposed camps is a product of uh, the lack of conversation. It's, it's, it, it's the opposite. So, um, and, and just as, a, as an addendum to that, because the, uh, in, in Sheila's talk, the, the, um, the issue of isolation came up. Um, the, the, I, I, I thought I would like to introduce this distinction that that Hannah Arendt makes between isolation and solitude. And, and she points out that for her as a philosopher, maybe not for everybody, but certainly for philosophers, um, thinking is done typically in solitude. You, you, you do talk to, spend an awful lot of time uh, talking to yourself and that solitude is often a, 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 a good state to be in for having productive thoughts. But then she says that solitude is still, a, is still a conversation. It's a conversation you have with yourself. And the self that you have a conversation with is a self that has periodically to be confirmed in the eyes of others. So that even if you are solitary, uh, even if you're carrying on a conversation with yourself in solitude, the world is there. The world has actually confirmed the self that you're able to have a conversation with. And, and the, the difference between solitude and isolation is that in isolation, uh, through imprisonment or whatever regime it is, um, you are cut off from those possibilities of self-confirmation, making it impossible after a while for you to talk to yourself anymore. And, and, and of course there are plenty of reports of, of people who have been put in solitary confinement in these kinds of situations as to, as to their struggles in trying to retain a self that they can continue to have a dialogue with and how eventually that's lost and that, that then really you're, you're, you, you, you get into, into difficulties. So th there's, a, there's a key difference there that that being so sort of wrapped up in yourself, as philosophers often are, isn't necessarily an isolated situation. And I, I think it's just as important to, to bring that out. Um, now, going on from there, there's another, I keep making all these distinctions, but there's another distinction I want to make. And, and, and it's between um, understanding and, and what I call following honey and moat and undercommoning. Uh, the idea of understanding is uh, 
well, it's something that in, in, in social sciences we're all supposed to be doing. We're all supposed to be understanding, understanding other people. And, and often enough, and this is how it comes out in, in my own discipline, we say, we say what we do as anthropologists, you see, and maybe you say the same in terms of, uh, of practitioners in your field, we, we, we understand people by putting them in their social, cultural and historical context. So we put them there and say, right, you are now understood. We've got you sorted. Uh, you, your presence is no longer really a challenge to us because you know, we know where you stand. And uh, even though you may do crazy things, your actions are now explicable to us. Uh, it, it's rather like you know, the, 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 the parent with, a, with an unruly uh, teenager who, um, who, before anything else, only wants to be noticed and, 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 and acknowledged as, a, as the being they are. And, and the parent says, oh, whoever says, uh, oh, yeah, you know, I was a teenager once. I completely understand. I know what it's like. And, and, and the teenager then proceeds to explode because they say, look, all I want you to notice is that here I am. So, so uh, I find myself often trying to say to my anthropological colleagues, no, the whole point of anthropology is not to put people in their social, cultural, and historical context, but precisely the opposite, to allow them to be, to acknowledge their presence, so that we can then hold a conversation with them, out of which both we and they maybe stand to learn something. And given the state of the world, uh, it's a bit foolish for any academic discipline to say that we don't need to learn from other people. We just need to learn about them um, because we know uh, best. I mean, in the present junction, I think the, the more we can listen to other people, um, the, um, the better. So, so I think understanding tends to be about putting people in context. And, and that means, rather literally, finding a common base of what we have in common, or a common uh, a level of, of, of uh, uh, yes, a, uh, what we have in, a base of what we have in common, upon which we can then, upon which we can then build. Uh, so we all have something to to stand on. I mean, one comparison you might make is between interaction that goes on on land and interaction that goes on on sea. Uh, when, 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 when people are standing on land, you're having a conversation on the land, you don't worry about whether the, you don't usually have to worry about whether the, la the, the ground will give way under your feet. You kind of take that for granted. So you, you, you're standing there, your other people are standing there, and you can start having a discussion. So we kind of assume that this discussion uh, exists in its own sphere of social discourse has nothing to do with the ground we're standing on. That, 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 so that's the understanding. We have, it, we have it there. We can take that for granted. If you go to sea in a boat, it's not quite the same. Uh, you're in a boat, and you have to make sure that that boat um, functions. And that requires often some degree of uh, solidarity and cooperation amongst the crew. So in fact, you then get a quite different quality of social relations at sea than you do on land. And that's plenty of ethnography to to, to support that view. So, so under commoning, it's about what happens when you don't have that common base to stand for, from, but rather where um, there's you and, you and another person, say, and uh, you, each coming from somewhere different, with different background, different experience, having to cast their, imagine, their, their imagination forward to a place where neither is yet, where they can begin to imagine a way of carrying on together. So instead of falling back on what you have in common to begin with, you project your imaginations forward to a place where you could possibly be. Um, and I've been very inspired in all this by writings of John Dewey. And John Dewey talks about achieving a degree of like-mindedness. He doesn't mean that you think, think exactly the same as the other person. But he means that you can project your imaginations forward and find a place where you can carry on life uh, together. And that, for him, is the essence of what a democracy should be, a search for that kind of, not, not a search for uh, commonality, as he's given in advance, but a search for uh, like-mindedness that enables life to 
to move on, to, to carry on. And uh, in that sense, um, you should say that if, if we're talking about problems and, and solving the problems that arise in life, there are real problems and there are fake problems. I think fake problems are problems like the crossword puzzle, the Rubik's Cube, the jigsaw, uh, the, um, the, the exercises you are given in, in your school mathematics class, where the problem already contains its solution. And it's simply a matter of finding it. So, so there's the problem. There's a solution inside. I will find the solution. Job done. The thing about life is that it's not a fake problem in that sense, it's a real problem. And the, th the difference between real problems and fake problems is that the solutions to those problems don't lie inside them, they only lie beyond them. So the solution to any life problem uh, can only be found by moving beyond uh, where you are at the moment. So, so life in that sense, I think, is, is a real problem. And um, it doesn't mean that, and we don't have to suppose that problems are bad things either. A problem can be a very good thing, it can be generative, it can be creative. And so if we think that life is inherently problematic, uh, well, that's no harm in, in that. It, it just means that we can actually uh, move on. Now, here's something I've been thinking about just, just recently, and I've not got, got it completely clear in my, my head, but it has to do with, with, with time. I imagined it like this, um, that imagine that in, in life everybody's sort of shuffling along. Uh, so you could, you could think of a queue. Okay, so then in, in a queue, um, oops, uh, I'll, go, I'll go horizontally. There, so we've got all these people shuffling along in the queue. And they're all generally heading in that direction. So these people, they got there before we did, they're a bit further on. Uh, to wherever it is we're all heading. Here's you, somewhere in the middle. Here are the people that came behind you, and then there are people after that, and, and people before then. And we could even imagine generations like that. You know, here's your generation, here's your, aunt, your parents' generation, here's your, your children's generation. And we're all shuffling along uh, forward with uh, following this, this, um, this, this general flow of, of, uh, of life. Um, and, in fact, I think among, many, uh, among indigenous people, generally, who say that, well, actually, what we're doing is following a tradition, and, and these people who went before, they're our ancestors, and we're following them. When the Pintabi talk about life as a one-possibility thing, well, they, they, their ancestors went there first. They, 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 they created the world, and, um, and here it is. So this is the line of possibility carrying on, and your ancestors actually are before you. Your children are coming <coughs> after there's something a bit odd about that, because in our way of thinking, the ancestors have already sunk into the past, so they're not the future, they're the past, and these people who are coming after you, they're the future. So it seems as though somehow the past and the future have changed places. And, and these guys, disappearing off into the past, well, they're, 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 they've had it, they're, 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 they're just disappearing into... Um, these people who are coming along in the future, they're, 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 the, they're the future, they're your children. What have you done? You've somehow turned around. You've turned around on the present. So instead of going along like this, you suddenly say, right, I'm going to face you, the children, coming this way. So, so children and adults, or the practitioner and the client, are in that face-to-face -face situation rather than carrying along in the same direction. And in doing that, this generation, these people, have staked a claim to the present. So if we imagine people going along in a queue, so as you were going along in a perfectly orderly queue, uh, uh, and so here we are going along in a queue like this, and then you decide to turn around and say, right, I'm here, and I'm facing you, and all those people who are coming along, suddenly start bumping into you. And you say, no, no, you can't. I'm, I'm, I'm here. And, and I will now tell you what, uh, what you are supposed to do. So 
uh, you, you then have a, a plan which the people coming along to face you are supposed to, to, um, to conform to. So what happens there, if you imagine this, this character here as the professional, who rather than just carrying, shuffling along like everybody else has turned around and said, this is how it is, the professional has now become a gatekeeper to the future, which is heading towards him or her. Uh, and there's a face-to-face there's -face confrontation. Uh, and, and of course, that, that takes us right back to the logic of rehabilitation. I suppose this is the prison therapist and this is the prisoner. So, so the prisoner is no longer allowed to move forward, but has to go through, across a transition into a state that has already been, a future state that has already been um, determined. So uh, again, the assumption is that the current state is crap and we have to introduce you into a new state. Now, um, I want to go back, back a moment to, to Hannah Arendt. I, I was recently rereading her article of 1954 on the crisis of education. It's a very strange article and sometimes a bit authoritarian and it reads sometimes in very conservative ways. And there's even a place where, where Arendt says, if you don't think like you should do, like this, you shouldn't have children. I mean, really, uh, it's, a, it's a bit bizarre in, in some respects. But, but what she's saying is that it is the responsibility of citizens of the current generation to introduce new people, that is kids, into the world they know, into an old world. And, and that means that they should love this world, love this world enough to take responsibility for it and introduce children into it, because only if you do, will those children then be able to carry on and create a, a world of their own or continue to create a world in continuity with the values of the past. And she, she makes a con and she says that, that, that is what education is or should be about. And she makes a contrast between that and what she sees as going on, uh, this was it, it's talking about post-war America actually, uh, in which the teachers and other gatekeepers are saying to the children that the existing world we have is crap. It's no good. There's a new world that we have envisaged for you and we will induce you into that world and we will set up the conditions of your access to it. So teaching becomes a process or pedagogy, a process of, of laying down the, the dimensions, the, the, uh, the shape, the institutional shape of what this new world will be and controlling children's access to it uh, by means of assessment regimes of various kinds. And she was writing in 1954, but you could recognize this immediately today. You know, the, the, the new world of a digital world, the artificial intelligence world, the, the smart world, the neoliberal world, the new world of competition, uh, the world of employment, as it's defined now, is education is to prepare children <laughs> for that world and to control the conditions of access to it so that some will get in and others will be uh, basically um, rejected. And for Arendt, that is not education, that is indoctrination. It's, it's the opposite thing. And so, so, so comparing indoctrination, education is one in which we should, if, if, how can we possibly educate young new people, she says, unless we actually love the world we're in. Love that world enough to be able to want to introduce our children into it. Because only if, they, if we do can those children grow and flourish and make sure that that world can continue worlding. Um, and only last week I was visiting the University of Bordeaux. And of course, when you visit the University of Bordeaux, you are taken to see people growing uh, uh, grapes in vineyards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spoke to 
a, a wine grower who is explaining about the way in which the tip of the vine communicates with the roots and the importance of main, keeping that communication going. And I thought that's exactly the analogy that you want. You have to have a connection. If you cut the vine, then it won't grow. It won't, it won't flourish. So in order for the vine to flourish, it has to have that deep connection with, with the roots, which enables then the tip to grow in continuity with the values of the past. That then point leads me to think about the question of profession, because it's come up quite a lot already, professions or professionalism, what we mean by it. Um, and I was, I, a while ago I was reading up on this, I, I didn't really know the literature on professionalism, but I, I started reading up on it because I was writing something about, um, about what has happened in the university uh, in terms of uh, the academic profession and what that actually means. And, and I discovered literature by, by sociologists dating from the, around about 2000, um, explaining and in a very convincing way, and I agree, that there has been a, a rather fundamental shift in the meaning of profession from what um, was called from, from social trusteeship to detached expertise. So the originally the, the, the professional was a custodian of public knowledge that he or she was expected by vocation to exercise on behalf of the public good. So if you were a, a priest or a lawyer or a doctor or anybody like that, you, um, you were looking after, curating, caring for a, a body of, of, of knowledge, which it was your duty, your vocation, to exercise in the common good. And that's what a profession meant. It wasn't anything to do with making money. It was uh, often you didn't make much if you were if you're a priest or something, you probably didn't eat, might have a nice house, but that's about it. And, and um, so, so that's what, what a, a, a profession meant then, and that also includes the academic profession. Uh, but today, uh, for all sorts of reasons, mostly due to, to the rise of neoliberalism, that's the cause of everything, um, uh, the, the, the professional is now somebody who is... Uh, uh, equipped by training with uh, a very determined form of expertise which can then be uh, marketed to clients or sold to clients quite irrespective of what you're simply performing a service so it's quite irrespective of what the client eventually does with it you're, you're simply a service provider and as we know too well uh, academic uh, researchers and teachers nowadays are generally regarded by their universities as service providers to uh, a clientele which consists of students, business, or whatever it happens to be. So there has been a shift in, uh, in the idea of the profession from social trusteeship to, uh, to um, detached expertise. And with that has gone a, a shift in the meaning of things which went along with professionalism. One is uh, a kind of uh, monopoly over the uh, use of certain kinds of knowledge. The other is uh, the importance of qualification. And the third is um, the factor of esteem. I mean, it, it, it is kind of reasonable. If, if you think of a profession in that traditional sense, it is kind of reasonable to say that, that professionals have a certain monopoly over the exercise of this knowledge that they're curating. Uh, that monopoly is something like a discipline. It's like a tent in which they can develop and look after this knowledge with a degree of safety insulated from all the turbulence and storms of the world outside. So they're caring for it, looking after it, uh, and, and that gives them a, a degree of monopolization over it. It's also reasonable to say that somebody who works as a professional has undergone a long period of apprenticeship. 
and therefore is qualified to do what they do and exercise the judgments that they make. And it's also entirely reasonable that professionals in a field should regard one another with a degree of esteem, should really respect and value the work that their colleagues, that they and their colleagues do. The trouble is that as professionalism has moved from social trusteeship to detached expertise, that uh, monopoly has now begun to look like um, uh, the, the, the uh, defense of special interests by particular professional groups. The uh, qualification has come to look like uh, marks on a curriculum vitae, and the esteem for colleagues has come to look like elitism. And, and the result is that professional, the professional has now become charged with this kind of uh, exclusivity, uh, uh, obsession with qualifications, and, uh, and aspirations to elite status, which is one of the reasons why in so much populist rhetoric, um, expertise, professional expertise is, um, is, is, is derided, uh, because it's associated precisely with these, with these evils. And that, that, of course, brings us right back to the question that I began with of life as a curriculum vitae. Uh, I, I argued that if we think about life as running a race, not from start to finish, but just carrying on, that is the curriculum vitae in the strict sense. We know actually the first, according to historians, the first curriculum vitae was written by Leonardo da Vinci, who produced a long page explaining about all the sorts of things he could do for a, for a possible patron. You know, I can build tanks, I can build bridges, I can help you win your war, I can do all these things. But then, then it was all forgotten until... Well, there were one or two curriculum vitae in the 1950s and 60s, but it really took off in the 1980s uh, with, with neoliberalism, and uh, now everything has to have, everybody has to have a curriculum vitae, which is no longer the course of a life, but instead a series of marked-up achievements. So it's like the athlete who will say, here's a list of all the races that I've run and I've won, but it's not my life because my life is running. So I think I would like to, to end by saying that perhaps the way to move is to bring return to the idea of the course of a life as a one possibility thing that we carry on in relations of correspondence with others. That's it. Thanks.